in the interest of in the interest of time, I am going to get us um, started. Um, give me one second, though, to do one thing here. OK. Um, welcome. I am Janice White. I'm the president of the Seattle Special Education PTSA. And I want to thank everybody for being here this morning and taking time out of your weekend to join us. We're very um, we're really looking forward to this presentation. Um, as you can see, we are recording um, the meeting. Um, it will be recorded and will be posted on our website for later viewing. Your attendance is consent for video recording and publishing. Um, if you are using ASL services, um, please pin the ASL interpreters video by clicking the three little dots on their, um, on their video and then select pin video. Um, for those of you who don't know us, we are an all district PTSA. Uh, we provide support for families and teachers um, of students who have disabilities in the Seattle Public Schools. Um, and one of the things we do is provide, um, present um, programs like today's program. Um, so just a couple of things, um, uh, because we do have ASL interpretation, if at some point you unmute and speak, please state your name before you start speaking. So um, it makes it easier for the folks who are using the ASL interpretation to follow along. Um, and please try to speak slowly. Um, so that the interpreters can, can um, get everything. Um, okay, I'm gonna go, um, I'm gonna go straight to introducing our presenters so that we can get straight to it today. We're very excited to have three special education attorneys joining us today. Um, we have Andrea Cadleck, who is a Disability Rights Washington staff attorney with experience in education, sexual assault and domestic violence advocacy, developmental disability systems, movement law, and youth leadership development. Andrea has over 20 years of experience with disability systems advocacy, including coalition development, policy and legislative work, community organizing, facilitation, and grant and project management. She was a regional developmental disabilities ombuds. She also served on the North Shore School District Special Education Parent Advocacy Council for over a decade with three years as chair. Andrea is neurodivergent and raised neurodivergent children. Um, Kathy George has practiced special education law for 14 years, including representing parents in IEP meetings, due process litigation, and citizen complaints. Kathy's nonprofit advocacy has included serving on the boards of two autism organizations, representing disability groups in the landmark McCleary versus State Education Funding case, and writing the 2015 law that prohibited aversive intervention plans and outlawed isolation and restraint, except in serious emergencies. In 2017, she received the Living Our Legacy Award for Children's Advocacy from the Ark of King County. A former newspaper reporter and editor, Kathy also practices public records law, helping citizens and the news media obtain information from government agencies. She has served as Governor Jay Inslee's appointee on the State Sunshine Committee since 2015 and received the Washington Coalition for Open Government's Public Service Award in 2014. Mary Griffin is an attorney who's of counsel at Johnston George LLP with Kathy. Um, she also provides pro bono legal advocacy in her solo practice. Mary represents families who have disputes with school districts and is well acquainted with the issues associated with the pandemic including compensatory and recovery services. This year, she has filed and won several special education community complaints against Seattle Public Schools for systemic violations of IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. 
He was president of this PTSA, the Seattle Special Education PTSA, in 2013 and 2014, and also participated in Seattle Public Schools Superintendent's Special Education Advisory and Advocacy Council, which is called SEAC, as well as the Seattle Special Education Task Force. As a parent, Mary wrote the white paper for SEAC on discipline and disproportionality. Also as a parent, she spearheaded the passage of House Bill 1688 in 2013, which required parental notification of the use of restraint and seclusion. She has testified at the local school board level, as well as at OSPI and in front of the Washington legislature on the use of restraint and seclusion, as well as school discipline, mental health, and various other special education issues. So we welcome Andrea, Kathy, and Mary this morning. I was looking for my unmute button. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. And thank you, everybody, for being here on a rainy Saturday morning to talk about how to file community complaints. Um, I am Andrea Cadlick, and I'm very happy to be here this morning with Mary and Kathy. Uh, we have talked a lot about community complaints, and I was excited at the idea of doing this presentation because when I worked in the North Shore Special Ed Parent Council uh, forever ago and forever, um, we talked frequently about, we were very nervous to do anything that would be contentious or not collaborative as a parent group, right? So. Um, filing um, what were then known as citizen complaints, they just recently changed the name to the community complaint, um, seemed to be adversarial to us. And so we were really nervous about it. But especially since the pandemic and since we've been filing quite a few of these complaints now, uh, we've really had the opportunity and Kathy has known this, um, you know, Kathy has been doing this a long time. So she's known this for a long time. But I've seen over the past year that you can really achieve systemic reform with these complaints and um, it's something that anybody can do. So we're hopeful that today will be a very sort of practical and interactive presentation where you can walk away with concrete knowledge about how to do these sorts of complaints yourself um, and what that entails and um, that it's relatively easy and an effective way to achieve change and hold districts accountable. So our format for today is hopefully will be very interactive. You can put your questions in the chat and we'll address these um, at the end if we don't get to them um, as we go. So we'll all, we will have some time for questions at the end. We are going to frame our presentation today around a student, student X, who's one of multiple students who didn't receive physical therapy that was in her IEP. So that is, uh, that's the case that we will work around today and we'll do some breakout rooms later so you can each practice building your own complaint, and then we'll come back and talk about that process some more. Why would you want to file a community complaint? Well, it's a mechanism to improve accountability within a school district. And um, it is a dispute. It's a formal dispute resolution process, but it's a less adversarial one. Um, and it's pretty straightforward. Anybody can file a community complaint and you could do it yourself or you can do it with a group of parents. Um, so, and we'll talk a little bit later about what systemic violations look like. Um, this OSPI can, um, we'll talk about some of the remedies too, but OSPI can uh, require districts to take corrective action. They can require training within the district and 
It alerts OSPI to potential systemic violations within its school district. So it makes the issues visible and easier to track across the state. Uh, and it gives legitimacy to problems. I know so often when we worked with a parent council, we were met with this is an isolated incident or um, you are, you're always kind of struggling with, is this just happening to one person or is this happening across the board? And a community complaint is really a way to demonstrate that there is a systemic issue. And so it might be a nice way for your group to file multiple complaints around a single issue or to file one complaint where um, you are alleging that multiple people have the same issue and to have that be addressed. Also, if OSPI issues corrective action as a result of a community complaint, it must be followed by the district or the district um, or OSPI must sanction the school district. So our dispute resolution processes, we'll take just a moment and sort of run through each of these. These are the formal dispute resolution processes for um, under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. And um, just so you're, you're probably already familiar with most of these, IEP facilitation is a is something that happens through you and you can request it uh, sound options produces the is the organization that produces the facilitators sometimes it's a really nice way to slow down an IEP meeting and make sure everybody is heard the IEP facilitator is impartial but um I know of instances where maybe English was not a native language and there were multiple um, agenda items that both the parent wanted addressed and the school district was um, concerned about. And it was a nice way to sort of slow everything down and make sure that everything was addressed in the IEP meeting. So that is, that is something that's available to you and it's a free program. Um, community complaints we're going to talk about more today and mediation is mediation. So this is also done by sound options and it's a little more complicated. Like anybody can ask for an IEP facilitation. Anybody can do a community complaint. You can do mediation on your own. Um, you may wanna get legal advice or have an attorney represent you in the mediation process. And you certainly would want to get um, legal advice for due process, which is a very formal hearing in front of an administrative law judge. Um, and you could seek attorney advice for any of these things, but um, also the IEP facilitation and the community complaint, um, it's easier to do as an individual too. So um, due process is a formal hearing before an administrative law judge. Um, and it's a very, um, yeah, it's a very formal process and you probably want um, to talk to an attorney before you go that route, at least. Is there anything else that you, Mary or Kathy, do you wanna chime in on anything here? Okay. So the community complaint process, the community complaint is just a formal request for an investigation from OSPI regarding a violation of federal or state special education law. And as we said, this is something anyone can do. So what makes a strong complaint? The stronger complaints are ones where there is a straightforward uh, problem that's easy to document. So some examples are your student has experienced a failure to implement services in the IEP. Um, so this could be your student hasn't had therapy in a year, your student hasn't had specially designed instruction, your student hasn't had access to the general education curriculum, um, anything in your IEP that has not been provided, 
over a period of time that you can document would be an example of this. Um, and maybe there aren't available staff to implement the IEP as written, um, or maybe there are accommodations in the IEP that have not been provided for a, for a time. So maybe your student hasn't had time and a half on tests or hasn't had access to assistive technology that um, should be made available through the IEP. Those are examples there. Um, so these are violations that are easy to document and the complaint can give you the benefit that you want. So um, there are procedural violations. Uh, in the example we were talking about last night is say you don't get a notice of procedural safeguards at one IEP meeting. So this is a violation of uh, special education law. Um, but if it's just one meeting and you didn't get the booklet, you could file a complaint, but that's a lot of work for um, one booklet. Now, if it's a systemic issue, maybe people aren't getting them in their native language or they aren't being given out at multiple IEP meetings, that might be a different story. Um, but you all know as parents that you sort of have to pick your battle. Uh, you have to pick your education, your advocacy battles, right? So you, wanna, you want to do the complaint when you know you can get um, a remedy that will work and you know it's going to be worth the work. So maybe another example is you're not getting recovery services that you agreed on or that you believe you're warranted, that you believe are warranted. And as always, it's good to have documentation and a clear paper trail. So this is a plug to and I had years where I was really good at this and years where I was terrible at it, but, um, you know, making notes for phone calls, keeping all the emails, um, and never assume that the documentation that you have will match what the school district has, right? So keep good notes and, uh, and use those when you file a complaint. So what makes not a strong complaint? More complicated issues of law. So we talked a little bit about uh, focusing on procedural issues, but if you have these more complex issues like placement or eligibility decisions or decisions that require an expert opinion or whether or not a certain service is appropriate, um, that's going to get really complicated and hard to manage in a complaint process. So there are other, there are other dispute resolution processes that might work for that. Um, you can always call one of us to sort of think through that, um, but a community complaint might be too, might not work for that, might not be worth that. Okay, so when do you want to file a complaint? If your student has not received services in the IEP, has not had accommodations, we talked a little bit about this, and then um, you might be the, and we saw this quite a bit during the pandemic where parents were implementing the IEP without school supports or you went out and paid for therapy services yourself. Um, also, there might be another violation of federal or state special education law and you don't have to know what the rule or the law is that was broken to file a complaint. You can just say in your complaint, this is what happened and you think it's wrong. Um, and then the state can figure out if there was a rule or law that was broken. So you don't have to know all the laws in order to do this. Okay. So I'm going to turn it over now to Kathy. Good morning. Um, before I uh, jump into the slides here, I, I just wanted to um, uh, thank Janice and the other um, leaders of the PTA for putting this together. And I wanted to give a little plug for Janice's leadership during <laughs> um, her tenure. Um, I've never seen so many letters to the school board <laughs> as I have since um, she's been at the helm. And so I just wanted to give a, a little plug there. Um, okay, so um, why would I file a community complaint? Um, 
and uh, to put it uh, another way, what will I get out of it if I if I put the effort into filing a community complaint? Um, the OSPI has fairly broad discretion in ordering the districts to correct their erroneous ways. Um, and so uh, uh, the OSPI can order training um, of staff either in your own student school or district wide, depending on what the violation involves, um, training in basically what the law is so that everybody understands what is the right thing to do going forward. Um, training is a fairly common corrective action. Uh, so if, if you believe uh, that's something your, your student or other students would benefit from, that could be a reason. Um, you can also get an award of compensatory education. You know, basically those are services designed to make up for um, either what your student missed altogether um, or uh, deficient services that were provided but were not adequate. Um, and so uh, that is also a very common remedy that OSPI will order in response to um, a finding of, of violations uh, by a school district. Um, <clears throat> uh, as the slide indicates, um, uh, another reason to uh, file a community complaint would be to enforce your student rights, or uh, to put it another way, um, uh, to show the school district that you understand your students' rights and you want the district to understand what those rights are uh, going forward. Um, and uh, uh, you, an, another um, reason offered here is that you want the district to develop written guidance and implement a uniform practice regarding an issue. I have seen that um, ordered by OSPI. It's a, it's a less common remedy, um, but it can be a very powerful one uh, in terms of uh, fixing um, systemic or ongoing uh, problems. So we can go to the next slide. Um, and I think Andrea is in control of the slides. Um, so when must I file a community complaint? Um, the simple answer is that you uh, have to file it within one year of the violation, not within one year of discovering the violation, but within one year of, of when the alleged violation occurred. And that is different um, from the timeline for a due process complaint, which is two years. So if for some reason you miss the cutoff for filing a community complaint, you still do have due process available um, for up to two years um, after the uh, violation occurred. Um, and, uh, this is something that um, has been especially relevant um, uh, since the pandemic, um, because uh, a, a lot of students missed services that they should have received during the school closure or even once schools um, uh, reopened. Um, and, uh, it wasn't clear necessarily in a timely way what kind of recovery services um, would be provided to make up for that loss. And so um, at least uh, uh, the um, deprivations that occurred during the, the three month school closure in the spring of um, 2020, th those are past the cutoff for a community complaint, um, but they are not past the cutoff for due process. Um, and I think Andrea already touched on um, the important differences between filing a community complaint and filing a due process complaint. With a community complaint, you don't have to be the parent. Um, you, you can be a teacher 
or a neighbor or um, you know someone who has no um, relationship with with the student. Um, whereas the due process complaint uh, can only be filed by the parents or in limited circumstances, it can be filed by a school district. Um, the school district will always have an attorney responding regardless of whether it's due process or a community complaint. So you're always gonna be up against um, an attorney on the other side. But as Andrea indicated, it is um, much less important um, to have your own legal representation with a community complaint because you don't have um, a burden of proof, so to speak, um, that you have to um, persuade uh, the decision maker on. Um, the OSPI investigator does the legwork. So that's an important difference in, in due process. You got to develop your own evidence um, and present it in a pers persuasive way to a judge. Whereas with the community complaint, you just make the allegation, if OSPI decides to investigate, then the investigator will do the legwork and ask the district for the records and the information that OSPI thinks is needed uh, to determine whether a violation were occur will, uh, at, did occur. <laughs> so that, that's a key difference. And um, of course, you can, you can bring a due process complaint without an attorney also. It's just going to be a little more challenging um, to uh, compete so to speak with, with the district's um, attorney. Um, and uh, there is also, if you've missed the one year cutoff, there's also the um, uh, option of asking for mediation. Okay, and we can move to the next slide. How do I file a community complaint? Um, so I am going to put in the chat a link to the relevant regulation. Um, and if you are going to do a, a complaint on your own, you probably want to look at this uh, regulation. Um, and, the, and there's also a link there to the OSPI um, uh, informational website about filing citizen complaints or community complaints, you probably want to look at that as well. Um, so the regulations say um, exactly how you're supposed to do this. There is certain content that is required, um, uh, and we'll go over those um, in more detail. Um, and uh, <clears throat> The complainant has to send a copy to the school district um, at the same time that the uh, complaint is filed with OSPI. Um, and you can either use a form or not use uh, uh, the, um, the form that is on OSPI's website. Um, uh, so those are handy links, and I think you all are going to get a copy of this um, PowerPoint, so you, you'll have easy access to those. And go to the next one. Um, the OSPI website does have uh, these complaint forms in a variety of different languages. Um, again, you don't have to use OSPI's form. Um, it is a, a handy sort of roadmap to um, make sure you get all that content that's required by the regulation. You, you can write it as a letter, um, uh, in letter form, or in whatever form might be easiest for you. Um, just be sure to include all the required content. And next slide. Um, okay. And Andrea, tell me when I've gotten past my, <laughs> my 10 pages. Um, uh, so, um, 
this is this is where we get into the sub substance of what you're going to put in your complaint. And um, so OSPI is concerned with procedural compliance. Um, OSPI is not the venue to raise um, allegations that um, a free and appropriate public education was denied substantively to your student um, because progress wasn't meaningful or um, you know, overall the program was not um, effective. Um, OSPI is the place to go when a procedure required by the IDEA was not followed. And you will find that if you allege any kind of problem um, with your student special education, OSPI, if it accepts the case for investigation, is going to give you a statement of issues. And that statement of issues is always going to start out with, did the district follow procedures when it did X? Did the district follow procedures when it did Y? Because that's what OSPI is concerned with. So in box A, you want to state what was the procedure that OSPI didn't follow? And you don't have to know the, the, um, the name of the regulation or the, or the citation to um, uh, a statute or rule. Um, you just have to give OSPI an idea of the nature of the violation, um, uh, whatever that might be. And a very common one for a citizen complaint is failure to implement the IEP. Um, uh, service that was required wasn't provided or an accommodation that was required wasn't provided. So that's where, what you're going to put in box A. What was the nature of the violation? Um, in box B, you're going to explain the facts that um, uh, constituted that violation. So what was the district supposed to do? What did the district fail to do? Um, and um, and then in box C, you don't have to attach um, uh, documents to your complaint, but it's a good idea to at least describe the documents that are going to um, show OSPI uh, those relevant facts. So those might be emails, um, uh, certainly IEPs, might be evaluations, um, progress reports, um, anything that's going to tell the story and show OSPI through a paper trail um, uh, what it is that you think um, uh, was done improperly. And then box D is, is what kind of remedies are you going to ask for? What, what would you like OSPI to order uh, the district to do? Um, is, is, it, is it still... Um, me, Andrea? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, so um, this is correct that um, disability discrimination um, is a matter for uh, uh, a different kind of complaint. Um, that would be the Office of Civil Rights of the US Department of Education. Uh, we won't talk about, um, about that. Uh, <clears throat> Avenue today. Um, um, a sample sentence of a violation um, that you could put in box A uh, would be something like, my students' rights were violated when the district did not provide physical therapy as indicated in her IEP um, for the specific uh, period. Um, so again, you don't, you don't have to cite the regulation or the um, statutory provision, but you want to give a flavor of what legally was wrong. Um, 
And uh, you certainly aren't limited to alleging a single violation. You can throw in as, as many as um, are appropriate. Uh, okay, box B. Um, so again, these are your facts that establish the violation. Um, oftentimes, uh, you, you're going to need to um, uh, attach uh, a separate piece of paper if you can't fit all the relevant facts into the little box if, on the on the form. If you're using OSPI's form, um, so you shouldn't uh, feel like you have to condense um, your relevant facts. Um, uh, there's a suggestion here to, to put your facts in chrono chronological order. That can be helpful for the investigator because the decisions are written that way. Um, if, if you've ever seen an OSPI decision on a community complaint, um, it, it tends to go from the first uh, development to the last development chronologically. Um, and uh, uh, right, if you're alleging uh, failure to implement, um, it is a good idea to count um, the minutes or the hours or the days of whatever service um, uh, was missing and spell that out um, to give the investigator a sense of the magnitude of, of the violation that you're describing. Um, okay. Uh, documents to be reviewed again, um, you know, what is going to um, persuade OSPI that a violation occurred? OSPI is, OSPI is always going to ask the district to turn over its relevant records. Um, and uh, you can make sure um, that OSPI requests all of the relevant records by suggesting in box C specific documents um, that, that will tell your, your story. Um, and uh, emails, by the way, aren't um, necessarily um, uh, easy to get. Um, uh, for whatever reason, Seattle School District and other school districts treat emails as public records subject to the Public Records Act instead of as education records subject to FERPA. Under FERPA, when you make a records request, um, the district is required to give you the records within 45 days and often does so in much less time than 45 days. With the Public Records Act, there's no specific deadline. Um, and so it, it can take quite a bit longer if you're asking for internal emails um, related to your student. I believe that emails specifically related to a student are in fact education records that should be produced <laughs> pursuant to FERPA. Um, uh, but anyway, um, in any case, um, emails are not necessarily records that the district is going to turn over to OSPI absent a specific request for them. So if you're aware of emails, either internal or emails that were exchanged with you, um, uh, you might want to mention, you know, the dates, um, uh, the, the details of those emails so that you can be sure OSPI asks for those, or just attach them um, to your to your uh, complaint. Um, and there's a note here to use this particular uh, records um, officer's email address to get your records. Um, I just wanted to say that under FERPA, there's no requirement um, as far as who. Um, to send a FERPA request to. So um, you can certainly use this address, but if there's somebody you find particularly helpful, principals, case manager, um, you know, 
special ed administrator, you can send a FERPA request to anybody. Um, and you might choose to send your FERPA request to somebody who's likely to handle it expeditiously um, if you're aware of someone like that. Okay, um, and box D um, is where you say what, what you want uh, the uh, uh, remedies to be. Um, and again, these can include compensatory services, making up for whatever was missed or deficient um, and, and uh, uh, training, um, written guidance. You can ask OSPI to order a new IEP meeting, um, to order a reevaluation. Um, OSPI has, has broad discretion. So um, it can be really anything that will put your student in the same position that he or she would have been if not for the violation. Um, it could be anything that will help prevent the same kind of violation in the future. Um, so these are just some examples of uh, possible remedies that you could ask for. And with that, I think I've taken my 20 minutes and we'll hand it over to Mary. Okay, thank you. Um, Andrea, can you uh, click on example of box B in that link there for everyone? Is that this or let's see. I can't see anything other than the slide. <laughs> so, okay. so what we're gonna show you here is someone has started the form and this is on the second page where you're asked to fill out the boxes. And as Kathy said, when you fill out the boxes, there often isn't enough room in box B for a narrative of the facts. Um, and so I've written up a short narrative of some facts. And what we're gonna do is read that and then we're gonna break up into small groups and we're gonna try in the small groups to fill out the rest of the boxes for the form. We're kind of sticking to the form because I think that that's not that, not that form, that's the filled out form. It's the narrative. Man. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's all right. I'm trying to share my other. screen, but I have to share. Yeah. Oh, I got um, it. Hang on. Okay. So um, this is a case of a student uh, during um, COVID closures whose parent noted that um, she did not make progress uh, and the team noted that, but they also didn't fill out their progress records. So as Andrea brings this up, so this is fairly typical uh, that there's not good documentation of progress records, um, but you might have other indicators of progress. Um, as an example, you might note that your student at home hasn't made progress on their IEP goals. Um, so that's one issue that you might wanna address. You might wanna address, there's a couple of issues in this scenario. So I'm hoping that Andrea can bring this up soon. <laughs> All right. But it's fairly short. I mean, I think, um, I think sometimes uh, it's easy to think you've got to nail every single little thing down, but maybe you don't need to nail everything down. What, what OSPI is focused on very much so lately during COVID is whether or not your student made progress. Um, and, and that will often determine whether or not you make, you get, the student gets compensatory services. Um, so as Kathy noted earlier, or else Andrea noted earlier, there might be violations, but if your student made adequate progress, they are, OSPI is just not going to get very concerned about it. So here is the scenario, and I'm going to read it, um, and then we're going to break up and talk about it in small groups and, and talk about what elements we might wanna include in the other boxes. And the daughter's name is X. She's a fun, loving, creative young girl who loves to read. She has physical disabilities that make it difficult for her to stand and walk, climb up and down stairs and transfer in and out of the wheelchair. 
At times, she has difficulty using certain bathrooms in the school. She qualifies for special education under other health impairments. On January 7th, 2021, her IEP team met and continued her physical therapy goals from her prior IEP of January 6th, 2020. Okay, so that is a big red flag. If you are continuing the exact same goals from the year before, that's an indicator that your student hasn't made progress. And a lot of times they might just move the baseline just a little bit, but generally if it's pretty much the same goals, um, that's a really good indicator that you can point out to OSPI that your student hasn't made progress. Okay, so I, and then we gotta go because she had not made progress on her physical, okay, I wrote that there. These goals include X will go up and down 12 stairs near the classroom with one person moderate assistance and X will transfer to and use a mobile stander for collaborative school activities during science class on five out of five opportunities. So I just copied these from the internet. They probably don't make sense, but those are some goals um, that I could I, use. By March, 2021, X still had not returned to school and a meeting was held how to, dis to discuss how to work on the goals at home. However, we do not have stairs for Sophia, oops, Sophia's name is actually X, to practice on, nor do we have a standard. At the meeting, this, the meeting, the staff discussed they would bring a standard to the home and would work on the stairs goal when X returned to school in person. And then I wrote, see the prior written notice from the March, 2021 meeting. The district never provided the mobile standard to us at home. Physical therapy logs during this time indicate that the therapist was having planning meetings with the teacher and other therapists, but did not provide any direct services to X. By April, X had returned to school. By May, X reported she had not once used the standard or practiced on the stairs, and that no one was providing physical therapy services to her. I emailed the team and did not receive a response. On June 1st, 2021, I emailed the team again, and I received a response from the principal that the physical therapist had given birth and that the school was out of without a physical therapist. I emailed the team and asked how X was going to receive her physical therapy. On June 12th, 2021, X's teacher emailed me that at some point X would be eligible for recovery services. I never received any notice of eligibility for recovery services. X started school up this fall and did not receive any physical therapy service until last week on November 5th, 2021. Per a September 29th, 2021 email from the school principal, there are staff shortages and the district was trying to locate physical therapists to work with X. X has regressed completely during this time frame. So regression is kind of a technical term that says your student has lost skills. So in other words, she's not just not making progress, she's lost skills that she had. She's not able to go up and down any stairs and is not able to participate in science lab with other students because the lab tables are too high and she is not able to use the mobile stander without assistance. Most of the progress records during this time are spotty. The June 2021 progress records indicates that the physical therapist was unable to assess progress due to lack of availability. So that is a very vague statement. And I've seen vague statements like this. This doesn't tell you anything. Was the physical therapist not available? Was the student not available? In any case, if she was at school, she was available. In conversation with other parents at the school, and even parents at two other school, and these are some phony schools here, that the issue of the district not supplying physical therapy services is widespread. So I am asking that OSPI investigate what happened with my child as evidence of a systemic violation by the district. So when you allege a systemic violation, you, you better have more than just conversations with other parents. Uh, you would want those other parents to also file their own complaints. Or it, in a very complicated situation, you may wish to help them file their complaints by filing them all together. It's, that is kind of a complicated issue. But if you're aware of an alleged procedure, policy, or practice that is systemic, that violates state or federal special education laws or rules, 
then you can file a systemic complaint. So that is that, and now we're gonna break up into groups. Okay, so, hi everybody. Yep, hi everybody, this is Janice. Um, we're gonna um, say goodbye to Seven, our ASL interpreter. We're not sure what happened, but the second interpreter um, is not here. And um, so for her safety, she cannot keep going. And um, we're, uh, but at least we were, we appreciate Seven that you stayed till now um, to interpret um, the, um, the program. Thank you so much. Um, so I have set up break up breakout rooms and I'm gonna send everyone to your breakout rooms for 20 minutes and I'll send you a couple messages um, so you know how much time you have left. Um, uh, Mary, Andrea and Kathy are each in a breakout room but we have six breakout rooms. Um, so the other breakout rooms have folks from our PTSA board um, and folks who you know, have some experience in the area um, as well. So, um, you know, I'm going to send you off right now. I'm going to actually pause recording. Welcome back, everybody. Andrea, Kathy, and Mary, you can okay get back. Okay, so we had a pretty good discussion in our group. Um, we didn't get through everything, and I think uh, people had a lot of concerns about their own issues, which maybe we'll have time to talk about at the end, hopefully. Um, and then um, I think there's more PowerPoint here. There you go. Those are the boxes. Um, Is there more PowerPoint? Oh, you're muted. Sorry, I'm clear all the things. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm pulling up the PowerPoint. Hang on. That's great. Okay, so you can click on that one that says example of a special education community complaint. You, so this is one that's filled out. Um, oh, you can go back. Maybe you could go back. Okay. Um, I just wanted to, to emphasize just a couple things with this. I'm not, yeah, yeah, here we go. All right. Here we are, we're flying off into cyberspace. Do you see it now? No. Or do I? Okay, I have to stop sharing the the PowerPoint oh and go back to the form. Oh no! Hang on. Okay, so this is a form that I filled out ahead of time, and I didn't fill out everything that you could complain about. Um, but you, you know, there's definitely a lot of areas um that you could complain um so i wanted to point out here uh in this second box here that um you need to oops no go back up sorry not that second box sorry <laughs> sorry okay um you need to send this to both the superintendent and to ospi when you mail your when you e you can email the entire complaint in um now um and um, okay, now you can scroll down. I just wanted to point that out. Okay, so uh, so I wrote not providing the physical therapies that are required by her IEP. I said, please see her attached the attached sheet for the facts, which is that narrative that that we all went over. 
uh, what documents support your allegation. So I went through and wrote down what documents I have. And you can send those along if you don't have them. I wouldn't waste a lot of time trying to get them. If, if you don't spend more than a couple of days trying to get these documents from your school district, because they will, they will have to supply them to OSPI. Um, and then what would we like to happen? I would like the district to reimburse me. So, you know, I don't know where I got those hours from. I'm sure it's more than that of compensatory physical therapy services to be provided by a private physical therapist to work on goals. And the reason I wrote it that way is because my gut sense is the district doesn't have enough physical therapists and it's gonna be difficult to get those compensatory hours lined up. And so that's why I'm asking for the district to reimburse for private. They will kind of balk at that usually, um, but you can ask for that. If you have the money to pay for that upfront, um, you would also like OSPI to investigate the district for systemic violation involving the provision of physical therapy services and to provide a comprehensive corrective action plan to include monitoring for up to 12 months. Um, you may want to ask for other things in there in addition. Um, so that was just like a basic, basic way to file a complaint. You can, this OSPI can order anything that they want. They may order training as, as was previously noted. They may order an IEP meeting to discuss certain issues that you raised during your complaint. Um, and that's, that's about it. Okay, so we can go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so we're gonna talk about systemic violations. So I think this is also called a group complaint. Um, the state or OSPI has a responsibility to investigate systemic violations of IDEA through federal law. You can say that you believe in your complaint that this is a systemic violation. The, the ways you can handle this are you can have other parents file about the same violation at the same time. If you write in your complaint that you're filing it, um, that you believe there's a systemic violation, you should put that in your complaint so th and ask for OSPI to address it as a sy systemic issue. Um, as a parent, it's difficult to file a group complaint with other parents. Uh, you may need releases from other parents. Other parents may not be able to get their complaint filed within the same time frame as you might be able to get yours filed. Um, and um, getting other parents to share their documents with you raises a lot of issues. I think the best way for parents to do this at this time is to either have ask for help from an attorney or a nonprofit that can help you with this or have, um, have everybody file their complaints at the same time. Um, in other words, not file uh, on behalf of six other parents. It, I've done that when I was a parent and it's, it's, it's difficult. Um, this is one way to hold districts accountable and achieve systemic reform, and it's a way to make OSP, OSPI investigate school district. It can result in training on the law, corrective actions, etc. You can consult a lawyer, a nonprofit, or I can't read this, I got a chat in front of there, or other for coordination. Yeah. So what happens after your complaint is filed? OSPI will um, decide whether or not to investigate. They open an investigation for 90% of complaints. That doesn't mean they find for parents in 90% of the complaints, but I would say it's close to 80% of the complaints that they open, they do find for parents, at least partially. Um, OSPI's community complaint timeline. Can you click on that, Andrea? Yes, but I have okay. to stop sharing in one space and go to the other. Oh. Um, so let me find my stop sharing button. Um, 
here. Let me move ahead and then I'll. Okay, I'll come, I'll come back to it. We already did this one. Uh, okay, uh, what happens after my complaint decision? It may be corrective action uh, um, or student school. Or, okay, so in decisions, you'll see they'll have corrective actions for the student and they may also have corrective actions listed that are applicable to the school. In other words, training for everybody on staff, or they may have something for the entire district, like the district may have to provide training for everyone or provide written policy um, or written guidance for everyone in the district. Um, so this is the timeline that OSPI uh, uses and they pretty much stick by it. Um, you will get a letter or an email after you file your complaint. If you file it by email, you usually get an email the next day saying that they've decided to open it or not open it. And the, the, they will list the issues in there that they're going to investigate and how they're going to investigate it. And as Kathy said, they'll say, did the district follow the procedures for X? You should read through those carefully to make sure that all the issues that you are concerned about are covered by how OSPI has defined the issues. And then uh, the school district has 20 calendar days to produce all the documents back to OSPI as well as respond in writing. Um, and they will uh, respond as to whether or not the allegations are true or deny the allegations. And usually they deny all the allegations. And then um, OSPI will mail that or email that to you so you can review it. And then you have 10 calendar days to respond to OSPI about what the district has said. So this is actually really friendly for parents because you don't have to deal with the district at all. Um, so you're just dealing with OSPI. The investigators are very, as far as I can tell, are fairly friendly with parents. Um, and you can call them and ask questions. And I encourage you to do so. Um, they will often call you when they have questions or email you and you can respond. They never answer their phones directly and you should leave a message and they will return the call within a few days. Um, so in exactly 60 calendar days, you will get a decision. Uh, you can count on that. And I recently told somebody that they never issue their decisions early and then they issued a decision early. Um, so, but it takes generally about, you know, no more than 60, 60 calendar days. Um, I think it's fairly, fairly family, parent friendly process. Um, and now we're going to go back to the PowerPoint. Uh, what happens afterwards? Okay, the decision is binding, you can't appeal it, but you can still file for due process. So that is, you would ask for a due process hearing in front of an impartial administrative law judge. Uh, the district must follow the corrective actions by the deadlines that are listed in the um, deci decision. Often OSPI will extend those deadlines. They should notify you if they extend them, but sometimes they don't. Um, if by law, if they do not follow the corrective actions, OSPI must sanction the district. Um, if, if this happens, you believe that the district has not followed the corrective actions listed by OSPI by their deadlines, you should call OSPI, your investigator, and, and ask them to follow up on that. Um, and I would also suggest that you might want to um, get public make a public records request to OSPI about the communications that your district has supplied to OSPI. Um, because sometimes things are not followed up as, as they should be. Um, and, and someone just asked if that was 60 calendar days. Yes, it's all calendar days. It's 20 calendar days the district has to respond, 10 calendar days you have to respond to the district's response, and 60 calendar days overall. Um, and then what happens after the complaint decision? Oops, I already did that. A note, districts may blame parents. Um, so this is very common during COVID. Um, 
district claims the parents did not do something or the behavior is rolled of poor parenting or the parent wasn't present in the room during the entire virtual school sessions or just did parent didn't provide enough rewarding experiences is one I've seen lately um, as to why a, a student didn't make progress. Um, and overall, we want everybody to know it's the district who is responsible for the IDEA compliance. When you write your complaint, make sure that you emphasize instead of student missed, say district did not provide, make sure that the emphasis is on what the district did not do to provide uh, compliance with IDEA. Uh, districts often have expectations that parents assist one-to-one -one with services, student transfers, remote learning assistance. This is not a legitimate explanation as to why students did not make progress. There's some kind of, um, I've seen a lot of bias, particularly against women, that women are supposed to stay home with their students and provide one-to-one -one assistance during virtual learning. Um, that is um, ignoring the fact that most women these days work. Um, students who were unable to attend schools when parents did not have instructions for remote learning in the native language are accessible for their disabilities. Ex explain barriers incurred with remote learning. Um, so uh, some, some students were not able to attend because um, parents who uh, were not speaking, who did not speak English as their native language we're not able to access uh, remote learning. Uh, this is actually fairly common. Um, a lot of these students are actually, have actually dropped out of school. Um, so this is, that's, this is a huge problem that we don't really talk about. And then it says lean on the special education PTSA or their parents to demonstrate this is not an isolated incident. Yeah, if, if you feel like you're being burdened with guilt by the school district, you can certainly share that with your fellow parents. Um, that is not a that is not a correct uh, perspective on things. Um, let's see here. What happens after we're going to go? Oh, good. We're at the end. Uh, Mary Griffin, Kathy George, um, and these are our, you can contact us here. Um, and then, let's see here. And this is uh, Andreas with Disability Rights Washington. They have free technical assistance that you can call and schedule for. And they have language interpreters. And Northwest Justice Project. Uh, provides free civil legal aid. Um, and that is that information. And so now we are, uh, maybe we can address some of the questions in chat. Um, Janice, do you have somebody who's gonna help us address the questions in chat? Yeah, I can do that. Okay. Um, and um, what I've tried to do, and Andrea, maybe if you stop sharing, um, so what I've tried to do is keep track of, um, uh, everybody who's put a question in the chat and I know that some of the questions sort of got answered in the chat, but I'm just going to kind of go through it. Um, so that if, if there, if you have a follow-up, um, on a specific question you can ask, and we just make sure that your question got answered. Um, feel free to also raise your hand if you want to do that and let me know that you, you know, you have some more questions to ask. So the first question that got in the chat was from Yana um, about um, records and when um, the family records don't match the school district's records of service delivery and OSPI investigator believes the district. So um, I know there is some back and forth in the chat. Yana, do you want to unmute? And if there's anything, you know, still remaining from that question that you want to raise? Yeah. So thank you, Janice. So, um, you know, it happened to us and it happened to a handful of families that I know that uh, during COVID, we were watching our kids not receive services, right? So we made 
the, the, our due diligence with, with uh, writing down the documentation, supplied the documentation, but because the district supplied different documentation and the investigator believed them over me watching it right here, mm -hmm. um, the district was not found in violation and, and the investigator decided that um, the student received services because the district says so. So how do we resolve issues? Because that to me is this, an issue of that investigator. And it's the same one actually <laughs> um, for four cases that I am aware of. Um, so, and I know that's an old issue with that particular investigator from before COVID hit. So what can we do with that? So Janice, I can, I can respond in a general way. Um, so that was a, an unusual circumstance, of course, when um, students were at home uh, and gave parents um, an unusual ability to see the services um, provided or not provided. But I'm just going to speak to going forward. How do you know what's really going on um, and how do you prove it? And um, there are a number of different ways that you can answer that question. So um, one way is uh, what we already talked about, making a request under FERPA for all of your students' education records. Um, and uh, the district has to provide those within 45 days. You can include in your FERPA request emails related to the student they might process it under the Public Records Act as opposed to FERPA, but it doesn't really matter. You can get them by asking for them. So you can do a records request. That's one approach to find out what's going, what's really going on. Another way is, of course, the progress reports um, that uh, are required to be um, provided at whatever interval is specified in the IEP. If you feel like you don't have a good handle on what's going on with your student's IEP progress, you can ask to, for more frequent progress reports. Um, oftentimes, uh, the default in an IEP is once a trimester. You can ask for progress reports you know, once a month or once a quarter or on some more frequent basis. Another thing you can do, um, and it's especially common um, when you have a home ABA program is you can ask for, uh, as an accommodation, um, you can ask for daily reports, um, not full-blown reports on each IEP goal, but daily reports on what happened with behavior. Um, you know, there might be a checklist of things that you're concerned about that could be checked off each day and sent to you. Or maybe if there's a behavior tech in place at school, you can get the behavior text notes for the day. But it is possible to have in your IEP an individualized requirement for daily reporting. It's going to give you a better sense of, um, you know, what's really going on. And the nice thing about all these records that we're talking about is that they're the district's own records, so they can't be disputed, right? These are the district's records. And then the other way to find out what's going on um, is observation. Um, you can ask for an opportunity to go into the school and observe your student's program yourself. I typically recommend um, that if you, have the opportunity to send your expert in instead, that's going to be a little better. Um, so if you have a private BCBA, private psychologist, independent evaluator, somebody like that, um, who's willing and able to go into the school and observe your student there and take notes, um, that's also going to be very useful as evidence whether you're planning on a community complaint or a due process complaint. So those are just some avenues to kind of get at that question. How do I know what's really going on um, and how do I prove it? 
Thanks, Kathy. Um, Pam asked, um, do parental rights also fall under community complaints? In other words, access records, amend records, et cetera. Anything in the um, WAC chapter 392172A is fair game for a community complaint. Anything in the special education regulations. And I'll, I'll put a link in the chat. Um, okay, there's a question. Um, can you describe the difference? I think this may have been answered, the difference between a community complaint to OSPI um, and um, a Department of Justice complaint or OSEP complaint at the federal level. And what about ongoing violations? So um, Department of Education Office of Civil Rights investigates uh, complaints alleging discrimination in education. And so this would be a place to go if you were alleging purely um, a violation of uh, civil rights. Uh, Department of Justice, um, I I'm not aware of them actually responding to complaint, individual complaints. Department of Justice will do investigations if it's something that may rise to the level of criminal um, or you know, large scale civil rights violations. So you'll see DOJ investigations. Um, I believe there was one in Georgia. I believe there are other ones. They're not common. Office of Civil Rights Department of Education would be for filing about an individual violation. Um, so I, I, I'm not aware of any DOJ investigations responding to one single individual complaint. Is any, are either of the other attorneys? No. So I would not write a complaint to the DOJ right off the bat. Um, the the DOJ's investigations were things uh, like putting all the special education kids in kind of closed down rundown schools in Georgia where they had no access to general education. So it was a huge issue. Um, okay, Yana had a question. How often do teachers or staff file complaints? Do you know the statistics? I've seen quite a few lately. Um, I don't know the statistics off the top of the he my head and they will not be identified in the decisions as teachers or staff members, they'll be identified as complainants. And uh, so you don't know, if, but you can usually tell from reading the narrative that it's a staff person. So, I, you know, it's not a large amount, but it's, it's regular. It does happen. The, it's usually, usually involving abuse. I would, I would, I would say a, a restraint and isolation lately. Um, Julie, I know her um, camera and microphone are not working. She's just listening, but she wrote, are there statistics on how often community complaints result in a violation in Washington state? Mary, I think you said about 80% are found. Yeah, actually, I was favor. trying to, I was trying to pull up. I have slides on that one actually somewhere. Um, I'll look at that and get back to that in just a minute. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm just scrolling through to get to the next question. Yeah. So um, there were a bunch of uh, answers. Um, so there were some questions about like sequencing if if you were to file both a community complaint to OSPI and a complaint to OCR in the Department of Education. Oh yeah, they will. OCR will not will not investigate if there is another investigation going on. They, uh, they'll ask you that right up at front and they will not investigate. If, if there's something remaining after any other kind of investigation is done, then they will, um, they say they will proceed. So I have the data up for um, 2020. There was 154 uh, complaints filed. They opened 120 and 19 were withdrawn. Uh, findings, oh, this, this, these are not good statistics because they are not complete statistics. Hold on here. I'll go back to 2019. 
134 complaints filed, 101 opened, withdrawn, 24 not opened, 33. Uh, findings 15 for the district, 26 for the complainant, but 36 are split. So overall in that, in 2019, um, out of decisions where there were findings, there was 62 that had some part for the complainant and 15 that were only for district. Okay. But um, it, it, a lot of times those are things like you're, the district is gonna hold an IEP meeting and that's a win for the parent, so, you know. Um, Christy Devoder, you had a question about SDI. Do you want to unmute and ask your question? Or do you want me to read it? Either way. You can read it. Okay. How do you find out if SDI is being delivered? I keep asking this question and I'm told SDI is provided by the special education credentialed uh, co-teacher. Um, hang on, sorry but no specifics are given, or if given the SDI sounds like standard accommodations for ADHD or differentiation, but not specific to my son's IEP goals. How do you gather data on SDI not being provided? Well, that, that's basically what I was addressing earlier. You, you, you do need permission to observe. Um, the districts don't have to allow observation. We tried to change that through rulemaking um, and OSPI didn't, didn't um, help with that. Um, so uh, other than those records that I was talking about, the, um, uh, the progress reports, the education records, uh, you know, the daily data, if you can get the IEP team to put that in the IEP, um, you can use records or you can use observation. That, that's basically it. Um, usually when the district does permit observation, it's only for a few hours. And usually there are district administrators observing the observer. <laughs> So it's not necessarily the most um, authentic um, a time to, uh, uh, for this, as far as uh, what the student is doing. Um, but that's really it. Um, it's, it, it. The districts have an advantage over parents in that their people are there all the time. Um, and it, it is difficult for parents to overcome that sort of um, imbalance in information. Um, Courtney has a question. Do you want to unmute and ask it, Courtney, or I can read it? You can read it. Okay. The question was if you could um, touch on the percentage that OSPI uses when offering compensatory, um, oops, I just, <laughs> Ed, compensatory education as a remedy. So if the child did not get 660 minutes of PT, how many minutes of compensatory PT will they get? Um, it, it, it depends. Usually if the child is supposed to receive physical therapy in a one-to-one -one situation, like direct. I have seen um, uh, the OSPI uh, order similar number of minutes for all direct minutes. That is not usually the case for most minutes. So usually it's much less, you know, somewhere between a quarter and a half if the student has missed classes where there is a large group of students uh, or has missed instruction in a large instructional, um, if there's a lot of students in the classroom, then it's a smaller amount of minutes. But it's, it's somewhat of a mystery. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think the theory is that because compensatory education is one-on-one -on -one and is more effective than, than group education, you need less of it to make the student whole. That, that's the reasoning. And, and that's why 
as Mary said, if, if the services weren't required to be one on one to begin with, um, you're most often not going to get hour for hour or minute for minute everything that the student missed as compensatory services. So Julie had a follow up question um, on Mary's answer about OSPI referring to progress on goals to show whether or not SDI is being delivered, which I think also probably relates to Christy's question. So um, what if there is little to no formal documentation of the assessments the district used to base progress reports on, even though the specific language of the IEP goals require specific types of measurements and specific, um, uh, specific sorry, it's hard for me to, um, specific items to be assessed like student work, curriculum-based assessments, systematic measurements. Yeah, so this is the brain exploding problem right now, okay? This, this is the thing that we're all grappling with. Um, I, I see such loosey-goosey progress notes written. I'm like, I don't know what to make of this. It doesn't even relate to the original goal. And so I think you're, you're in a situation where you have to demand that they go back and you know, use the measurements that were specified uh, in the progress. Um, you know, I, I would go back to the IEP team and say, you know, I'm very concerned about my students' progress and I need to know if there's progress being made and the progress notes that uh, indicate that there's progress aren't, I can't, you know, I can't access the information about that. You know, please deliver something written to me that talks about the progress my student has written, made on the measure in the measurements that were originally stated. This is just a gigantic issue. I mean, it's it's ridiculous, um, especially when students were at home during COVID. Um, so seeing such goofy progress notes written, I just was. It's beyond me. Heather, did you want to add something about this? I actually wanted to ask a question. So I this is a this I'm seeing this everywhere in the Puget Sound right now, where you're getting these progress reports with literally only subjective information and no actual data relating to goals. Johnny is doing well. <laughs> He, we're gonna we're gonna complete these goals and then like literally nothing literally nothing like on the next reporting period it's like it, it it's it's mind-boggling to me so in 2018 guidance was provided from ospi around progress monitoring and i'm just wondering has there been any complaints around progress monitoring that they're not fulfilling those sort of um measurement pieces that were part of that guidance and tips from the field as part of the OSPI special education updates, because this is a chron I mean, this is chronic, not just in Seattle, but it's, it's everywhere. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm curious what you guys are seeing if there are more complaints, just that they're not even meeting the standard that OSPI has said we should be meeting within progress reporting. So I think I saw some, so I've written that in a complaint um, and, I, and I wish I had referred to the guidance that you just stated, but I have written about the fact that the progress reporting is just too vague. And usually I think I've seen OSPI address it, but they basically just tell the district that they have to you know, provide written guidance to their school teams. They, there's no penalties. I've not seen anything where there was any penalty about it. Or they may say, hold an IEP meeting and discuss the student's current progress, you know, using uh, baseline language. Um, they may say something like that. But as far as any sort of systemic corrective actions that are meaningful, I, I haven't seen anything like that. But it, right now it's just, it's. I, I would say at least 50% of the progress reporting that I see is, you know, doesn't meet anybody's standards. Yana asked, um, 
how often does OSPI require the district to reimburse parents for services? I haven't seen a lot of that. I have seen it occasionally. So under what circumstances, Mary, what, what makes it successful when asking? I think it's going to be very difficult right now, Yana, because of the fact that you're, you're in a double whammy, if, especially if it's services you've already paid for. Uh, the fact that OSPI is consistently looking at whether the student made progress as to determine whether the student needs recovery services, you're going to lose on, uh, on whether or not, this, you're not going to be able to prove the student needed services unless you can pr prove that the district completely did not provide the services to start out with. So for example, if my student, or I know, again, a few, were not evaluated after the parents requested it and the evaluation was um, delayed and the, the services are now, let's say the, the, the student went through the evaluation process and received an IEP and those services are on their IEP, but were not and were provided by um, the parents during the time that the evaluation was not being done for a year four, six months and yeah so this is one of those areas that we talked about you so you've got a complication there it's not as straightforward and I don't really know what OSPI will do with that well this is not my just my case I just know yeah. that there is there is another parent in my school I know there's another parent in a different part of town with the same issue whose kiddos were not evaluated I think them. I think this is a really big issue the fact you so you should complain first of all that they didn't get the evaluation in time um I don't know you know I I think by September 2020 um OSPI was very clear that districts were on the hook for sticking to the deadlines. Um, and I haven't, I haven't seen a lot of what the corrective action will be for when they don't do those evaluations in time. I, I kind of wonder if a situation like yours would require an expert to say what, you know, what the student, what kind of progress the student made because you supplied your own services or you know what was lost there i'm not really sure what ospi would do with it so um i just wanted to say that um when ospi awards compensatory education it typically is an order for the district to provide the services but um, it doesn't preclude the parent and the district negotiating for a reimbursement of a private provider's costs as an alternative. So even though the, the order um, for comp ed may um, assume that the district will pro provide the services, um, it is possible to negotiate um, for a different arrangement. Yeah. Uh, so. That's a good point. It's very, very common to do that, to, to do something that will work better for the district and for your student and for your family. Um, Katie asked, is a school level violation systemic due to insufficient staffing or does it have to be district wide? So hey, oh. I would, I wanted to suggest that Mary talk about the complaint she successfully brought on a systemic basis. I was bragging about that, Mary, during the breakout. Oh. Um, because, uh, you know, my understanding is that OSPI rarely does investigate violations on a district-wide basis. It's, it's not common. But do you want to just take two minutes and talk about the one that you did on the delays in in-person services? OK. So yeah, this will give you an idea of what it takes. So a lot of people requested in-person services at the beginning of the 2020-2021 school year. And OSPI uh, delayed having those IEP meetings quite a bit. And then when they did have the meetings and decided a student needed in-person services, 
they um, did not um, immediately or reasonably start providing those services for up to 20 weeks. Um, and so it often took parents quite a battle just to the point where they would have an IEP meeting and then, and then to wait forever to get an hour a week or an hour a day of, of services. So I filed a complaint originally on behalf of three students who had been unable to access in-person services or um, virtual services and had requested in-person and didn't get any in-person at the time that I filed it in January of 2021. And then, um, so those three, they found huge violations. Those parents, those students were all awarded hundreds of hours of compensatory services, but OSPI did not investigate it as a systemic violation, okay? Then I dug through old complaints that were posted on the OSPI website from fall of 2020, and I found two more alleging similar facts. So that's up to five students where OSPI had already found violations. Then I found another a student who had experienced delays and, uh, and that mom uh, graciously allowed me to file a complaint. And with that complaint, I uh, was successfully able to, um, this OSPI undertook that uh, as an, in, instigation for or an investigation of uh, systemic practices. And so uh, they did um, investigate and found hundreds of students that had been delayed from three to 20 weeks. And eventually they decided that only students whose in-person services were delayed by eight weeks or more would receive compensatory education. Um, and, and it's a long story, um, uh, but those students are supposed to receive tutoring of three hours a week for the rest of the school year. There's been a lot of problems because OS, Seattle Public Schools did not adequately notify some of the parents and some of the parents didn't receive any information, even when they were told they were eligible, they didn't receive adequate information about what the services would be. So this is a story that's continuing. I'm still sending emails back and forth to OSPI. But um, I had another systemic complaint with students who uh, mostly were on ventilators, who when uh, Seattle Public Schools decided they didn't need ventilators or nurses during a COVID and um, put these parents in horrible situations as far as staffing, because most of them um, were receiving services from other providers like DDA based upon the nursing that was gonna be supplied by the school district. Um, so for 30 hours, they were out of nursing services, 30 extra hours a week. And a lot of these parents were so sleep deprived. It was, in, it was just pathetic. And they came down very, very hard on Seattle for that decision. And uh, they actually um, decided they were going, they, you know, Seattle was going to supply the nursing services and OSPI was going to attend the IEP meetings um, of these students in the fall to follow up. And they're going to have an hour, a year of monitoring on that. So that's... That's my rundown on that. So they can be very effective. That's life endangering. How yeah. is that even, how is that even not making the news? Not a question for you, thanks, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so I think that answer actually probably answered M's question about couldn't districts say what the number of students in, in the same situation stated in the complaint. I think that was pretty much covered. Um, uh, Jen asked about whether the 60 days are calendar days, and I think that was answered as well, it's calendar days. Julie asks, what if a district states they will do something 
like clarify language district-wide, train staff and teams related to language in response to the complaint. So OSPI does not make it a corrective action, but then there's no follow through on what the district said they would do. Oh boy, that is a great question. Um, I would, I would, um, I would go back to that investigator and give them the facts about whether, so I had something like that happen. And I explained to the investigator that what the district represented was um, not correct. And that, um, and I went back and forth over it. So I had to persist. So I would say that the message here is go back to OSPI, the investigator on the complaint and persist with them about that issue. It's a huge issue. Um, Yana, did you want to say something about that? Uh, I have a, like a related question, you know. Go ahead. So um, what seems to be happening with um, decisions from OSBI, um, which just keeps troubling me that we have this um, route to take and it doesn't seem as effective as it should be. Um, and I keep seeing, okay, um, that the requirement is for the training to be provided as written guidance to the to the staff involved with the student which you know of course if i have a student going from one school to the next school they're providing it to two teams but that doesn't seem enough especially if a special education director keeps coming and this is not this district but um it keeps coming to the meeting so and they're not aware of problems so it just seems like it should be a more vigorous training and i you know like providing something in writing doesn't seem like training to me um so i would like to see how we could make sure that OSBI is actually re pro either providing to training instead of requiring it because i don't see the districts being all um effective in the because the, the same issues keep coming up after the corrective action plan was completed so how do we ask for coaching versus training versus or or written guidance to this team members so that it is more systemic of an improvement how what can we do if anything so they they do have the choice of um they will require districts to go to training by, uh, or they will require district staff to go to training from an outside provider. And sometimes they will specify training from somebody from an ESD or some OSPI sort of trainer. Um, I Like you, I, I, I was somewhat let down when I saw the written guidance that was provided, it was an email. I mean, I follow, I'm following up on my complaints. And basically it was a very low key email that said, we had we have to give you this written guidance because somebody filed a complaint about it and it was like seven sentences so uh, you know that could easily be ignored um i so i'm disconcerted about that too i guess the only way is to ask for the kind of training that you want you know and and you have no guarantee of what they're gonna there isn't any way you can make ospi um do anything you can ask for it how really we should be able to. I mean, we are the public that they're serving, right? You, you can't make them do anything. No, <laughs> you can I, ask. Yeah. And I, I always ask and I persist in asking, but uh, yeah, I, I know what you're talking about. It's disconcerting. So Pam asks, can you speak to settlements as a district response to a community complaint? And what are the advantages or disadvantages to this route? I, I wouldn't settle. Yeah, that's true. You you would you'd have to get all you all the people to agree. I don't know who's talking, but yeah, you you'd have to get everybody to agree. Um, I wouldn't settle. That's probably Scott. Um, I don't I don't know. Anyway, um, you wouldn't settle uh, in a, a community complaint because you need that enforcement from OSPI basically. I, I would not settle a, a community complaint on a group. Um, I, I would just add that, um, at least in my experience, um, when 
a school district admits fault and proposes its own remedy, OSPI is very likely to award that remedy. And so in that circumstance, it could be to your advantage to just go ahead and negotiate your own terms because um, OSPI encourages um, voluntary resolution, likes to see that, and it's most likely gonna embrace whatever the district proposes anyway. <laughs> um, so that, that is a situation when settlement might make sense. Yeah, but I, I think in a case of a group complaint, it's it, I wouldn't oh. I would that's what I think the yeah, but go ahead and settle if if whatever if you can get a settlement with the district and you want to do that and the district's offering it seems fair to you, go ahead and do that. There's there's no problem with that. Um, but I, I wouldn't settle a group complaint. No. All right, Janice, can I just follow up on that because my question? Go for it. Did. Um, so we did. Uh, do is have a settlement with the district and we withdrew our complaint. Um, my question is what happens if the district doesn't make good on what it has agreed to do? Do we have any recourse then? Can we resubmit a complaint saying the district has provided compensatory education? However, they haven't provided all the trainings that they agreed to within a timely manner, like within a year or something of us coming to that agreement. How does that work? Uh, you could definitely resubmit the complaint. Mm -hmm. I don't think you could, you can, I don't think you can bring that, Kathy, maybe you can comment on whether you can bring that into a court, um, but I don't think so. I think you, sh you should resubmit the complaint if they haven't, they've defaulted on their agreement. So, because. Um, yeah, Mary and I have, have been looking at records we got from OSPI through a records <laughs> request. Um, regarding the follow-up um, to corrective actions and districts are supposed to submit evidence that they did carry out um, corrective actions. Um, what we found is that, in, and this happened to a client of mine, sometimes the districts will just lie <laughs> and say they've done something that they haven't done and uh, one of the concerns that I have about OSPI's handling of that is that um, it will not share the um, post order communications with the parent unless the parent makes a formal records request, um, which I think is outrageous. I think the parent should just be automatically given upon request any correspondence between OSPI and the district about carrying out the corrective actions. Uh, but anyway, um, it's a violation, you know, to uh, defy or fail to carry out a corrective action order. And so that's fodder for, you know, another complaint and it could be another community complaint or it could be a due process complaint. Um, when you get into due process, it's a heavier burden, as we talked about, um, because a, a due process judge is not going to care about a procedural violation alone. A remedy is only awarded if a procedural violation denies a free and appropriate public education. In other words, prevents the student from, you know, benefiting um, in a meaningful way from education. So, um, but, you know, if, if the procedural violation rises to the level of denying the student a, um, a beneficial education, um, you could ramp it up and turn it into a due process complaint. Um, I, I just wanted to comment. I think she asked, asked about a settlement when the district hasn't fulfilled terms of the settlement. Like they settled before the decision was made. Is that correct, Krista? Christy? Yeah, that is correct. So we oh. would have that. Yeah. So I think I think I would just go ahead and refile that complaint and just say that the district did not do what they agreed to do. Um, Jen asked some questions about IEP facilitation that Andrea answered in the chat. I just want to make sure, Jen, if do you still have any questions about 
IEP facilitation, or does anyone else want to hear more about that? I'm interested in hearing more about that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Just like who to request the school record. Sorry if there's another Jen, but I think mine was like our IEP is coming up, and who do I go and request the school records from? So, oh, go ahead. Go ahead so you can ask for them from your principal or you can ask for them from the special education uh, case manager or your special education director. I okay. often tell Maybe parents. Just include them. Yeah. yeah, well, I often I actually often tell parents, especially if they've had problems getting records to just use that email sped records at seattleschools.org. I get a, a turnaround of less than two days usually and I get all the records um and i wouldn't say that uh i mean every school district is different but that right now seems to be working fairly well in seattle it's unusually well <laughs> and i think yeah parents, i just yeah sorry. yeah i think parents um will have more success because i've talked to a lot of parents who've had they get parts of records from different people but they don't get all their records so you'll get all of the sense. records except for like your attendance records and your grades from from emailing sped records and then if you want to get the grades and attendance you would get those from the uh print building principal usually okay um liz had a question what recourse do i have if the school does not provide these in 45 days And I think you were talking about FERPA, Liz, right? Yeah. So I can I can speak to that. Um, FERPA has no cause of action for um, a violation. So you can't go to court and sue the district for missing a 45 day deadline. For that matter, if the district violates the privacy provision of FERPA and gives your students confidential information, to somebody who's not supposed to have it, that is not a cause of action either. The only enforcement mechanism uh, for FERPA is um, to file a complaint with um, uh, the US Department of Education in Washington, DC. Um, and uh, the remedy if a violation is proven is that um, federal funding theoretically can be withheld from the district, um, which never happens. So FERPA is kind of a toothless statute, um, uh, but I should mention that your rights under FERPA are paralleled by um, a records access provision in IDEA. So if you ask for records under FERPA, you're essentially asking for them under IDEA also. Um, and uh, then you have all the remedies available to you under the IDEA, including community complaint, due process complaint, and so forth. Yeah, you, you can file a citizen com or a community complaint about not being able to um, inspect your records. It's 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 actually commonly done. Um, but I would, I would try that email before it's be way easier before filing a complaint. Um, Yana, do you have a question about records? Yeah, I just wanna say that um, I uh, share that I, I am requesting records to be provided to me before an IEP meeting. Um, because I want to review, you know, progress and anything else. And I always, as the person with disability, request them to be provided a week ahead. And that way I can share them also with my um, private providers, my kids' private providers, and um, other people I might want to go over them with, whether it's an advocate or, or an attorney, you, you know, that, that's a good way just to let the staff know that that's what you're doing. And it is not unheard of to reschedule the meeting because the staff didn't provide the record. So um, oftentimes they learn that if you reschedule because of those records, they will not, um, you know, they will next time provide it. Not always, uh, but also 
you know, the, I know that OSBI is looking at that as, um, you know, as a violation, not providing it promptly prior to the meeting. So that's good to know for parents. Um, Ashley, you are next. Do you want me to read or do you want to unmute? If you could read, that's great. Okay. Um, if our son didn't get full services due to understaffing, but he made progress because our family will hemorrhage out before we let him fail, um, ooh, wait a minute. Um, will, um, sorry, it's the way it's showing on my screen, it's a little hard for me to read, will not be responsive. Also, while he didn't have a focused teacher, IA's quote taught him supposedly supervised by a resource teacher who had a caseload between 65 and 120 students. Unfortunately, our IEP is vague and says the services will be given by the quote special education staff. Does this mean we are unlikely to meet with much success for those minutes administered by the IAs and also do to the fact that our kiddo isn't falling behind. The IA still haven't met all of his minutes and he still doesn't have speech or OT and is flailing in both of those areas. Um, I think OSPI would be interested in that kind of a caseload because I, I, I mean, I've seen them do this before where they analyze how many minutes each student gets when they have that kind of a caseload and how much supervision could possibly happen in a school day. Um, you're right when it's, um, if the goals are vague and the student has made progress, it's gonna be a more difficult case, but I, I do believe OSPI would be interested in that sort of staffing. So, I, I, as well as all the therapy issues. You can, you can ask for the IEP matrix to be more specific about who who the provider is um, uh, because that is a problem when when you want a certificated teacher and it just says staff um, the tech technically there's no violation if it's an IA instead of a teacher providing the service um, an IA is not a teacher and it's not supposed to be a teacher the role of an IA is supposed to be helping the student to learn from the teacher. Um, so that is something you can advocate for in the IEP arena to have the right person delivering the service. Yeah, when I if I would file that complaint, I would ask for the investigator to talk to the IA about the level of supervision that the IA is receiving. Um, I would ask for a lot of investigation with that sort of issue because that's affecting a lot of students and it's a huge, a huge injury, despite the fact that you're educating your own student so that they don't make, that they don't fall far behind. Um, I, I would ask for a, an invest, a systemic investigation in that case. Thank you. Um, I just wanna um, note the time. Um, we've gone over our time. Um, I personally can stay until 1230 and I, I don't want to assume that Kathy, Mary and Andrea can stay so they should let us know. Um, and Yana is available to pick up for me at 1230 if when I do have to leave because I have to go pick up one of my kids. Um, so, um, uh, but, you know, again, I don't want to impose on Kathy, Mary and Andrea if they're not able to stay. Um, and, and we have so many, we still have a lot of questions here. Um, and so, um, you know, we I, really I have to, I have to go because I have a grandson here and my other son is babysitting and I only got him for till 12. So, okay. I, you know, I'm thinking we're seeing a real need here. So we will have some more conversations about, um, you know, how perhaps scheduling another session, um, you know, to, to do some follow-up. Um, we can also collect the questions that we didn't get to. Um, and, you know, try to try to get figure out a good format for um, getting answers and circulating those to folks. Um, so let me just ask Kathy and Andrea, do you are you in a position to stay for a few more minutes or do you like Mary have to leave or, um, you know, 
because I, I, I don't, I, and Mary, thank you so much. <laughs> All right, thanks, bye. Um, I don't want to contribute to anyone's Zoom fatigue, <laughs> like, but Janice, I can stay as long as you stay until what, 1230. Um, okay. And yeah, if, if people are still looking for <laughs> information. Okay. Um, okay. Um, we have a question, uh, and I may mispronounce your name. I don't know if it's Aim or Amy. Uh, why is it up to parents to make these problems known and then resolved? Why isn't OSPI proactive in educating districts and seeking out issues that need to be resolved? I think that's a great question. Um, OSPI does provide technical assistance and they do monitoring, so they are, um, Hopefully they find some of these issues too, but um, it, this, is, this is why we wanted to come talk to you today because we are hoping that you can be another set of eyes in districts and um, help OSPI see these violations um, because it's another way to, for, for us all to work together to achieve systems change. Um. Okay, here's a question um, from somebody who asked me to read it. Um, I decided to continue remote learning with my son this year. As a result, my son went into the first weeks of school without any SDI or any accommodations. My son is regressing in school now and I have pushed back many times. The director tells me that remote learning is a choice and that there is no way for the district or the school to serve my student all of his hours in his IEP. I again pushed back and they came up with a plan to provide some SDI with his special education teacher. And we'll give a few more hours in his gen ed classes with um, step-in services from, um, hang on, sorry, from a para. Son has a specific learning disability, anxiety and sensory processing issues. They are completely removing his social SDI. Can they do this? What are my options? I am exhausted. I'm exhausted from pushing back and getting nowhere. So Janice, we've, we've had some conversations about this, this problem that which apparently is pretty common in, in Seattle. Um, so some students do need to, um, stay home um and uh the way to to get a home placement is through the iep process um the district needs to consider um you know whatever individual reasons exist for a student to not return in person and um and decide on a program that is going to provide a, a free and appropriate public education. Yeah. So the yeah. fact that, so in other words, it's it's not the parents' burden to figure this out. <laughs> um, and I think the school district created a, a wrong impression early on that a parent could just go out on on his own or her own and arrange remote learning and then expect the district to um, uh, fill the gaps. And that's not how it works. The district should be deciding at the outset, this is a student who needs to learn remotely for disability reasons. And then the district should be building the program to meet that student's needs. So I don't know if I explained that very well, but um, it, it's an IEP decision. The special education regulations require every district to offer a continuum of placements. And on that continuum is the home. Um, and a home can be an ongoing placement. There is such a thing as home instruction that's temporary uh, while a student recovers from an injury or an illness, but 
home can also be a long-term placement that you get through the IEP process. Mm -hmm. And it it's that's what the district should be addressing in these situations. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is yeah. is the home the appropriate placement? And if so, how how are we going to provide a free and appropriate public education? Um, so I don't know if that helps helps answer her her question, but um, that that's what I can offer. Um, we had a follow up about the special ed records email, which I know um, Mary was talking about, but somebody wrote whether that Mary's information about that was still good because she said she spoke with the excellent employee last year who told me they were cutting the department and she was being let go. So I don't know if anyone on the call has um, had recent experience requesting records from that email address. Um, so, because this person was curious if it's still as efficient as they were before. Um, so I, this is Yana, I wanna say that I have received responses from that email address. Uh, and the person who was there a few months ago was there a month ago. So I don't know if this is fairly new, um, but I have been receiving responses now. I have, I just re uh, requested, um, no, not me, actually. I, I helped somebody <laughs> request records. I shouldn't have said that, but um, from that email address. So I will find out what they hear back. But also if you copy the public records email address, somebody will get back to you and gather it together. So I can put that email address in the chat as well. Um, here's another question. Um, this is a big one, so it may end up being our last one, unfortunately, today. Um, are there issues of retaliation with district staff after filing a complaint? Well, it's it's illegal and to retaliate for advocacy. And Andrea, I saw that you unmuted. Do you want to talk about that? And let me just say there's a follow-up, which is if there has been retaliation, what next? I can put the link for the Washington law against discrimination in the chat. Um, so you, that's where you, you could follow up with the Human Rights Commission if there is retaliation. Um, I, I don't know, I haven't seen that, um, but, but I also haven't done as many of these as Kathy and Mary have, so. Um, I might fit in one. Yana, you have a question here at the very end, and maybe we can fit this one in as the last one. Um, what is the requirement? Sorry, I'm having for um, for districts to provide instruction by certified teachers as opposed to IA para educators for disabled students. Is there a reference parents can use when they find SDI delivered by IAs inadequate? Well, um, there isn't a requirement for all instruction to be delivered by certified teachers, for example. Um, you know, a speech therapist can deliver specially designed instruction um, uh, so that there isn't a requirement quite quite that broad, um, but uh, teachers do have to be certified if, if they are teachers. And um, uh, IAs are not teachers and um, the state OSPI has recognized that their role really should be to assist the student to learn from the teacher and not to be the de facto teacher. So it's something, it's really um, an issue for the IEP team to um, work out and be specific in the matrix of services. So ultimately, if the district 
puts in the matrix that an IA instead of a teacher is going to be providing specially designed instruction, that's a pretty big red flag about the quality of the program. And ultimately, your remedy is, is to, you know, um, uh, to file a due process complaint and show that it's not working and that your student isn't benefiting, which isn't a great, it's not a great um, uh, enforcement um, system. Um, but ultimately, that's what matters is um, as long as the people providing instruction are providing a free and appropriate public education, allowing your student to benefit from his or her education, then it's going to be considered legal. But it's, um, it's always a concern when the district is relying on relatively, you know, um, uh, lower paid, lesser trained uh, people um, to provide uh, the majority of instruction for a student. And it's discriminatory because students without disabilities get their instruction from certif certificated teachers. Um, sorry if that was a convoluted answer. I guess I'm getting tired and it is 1230. <laughs> it is. I, I want to just... Um... Thank uh, Mary and Kathy and Andrea for the presentation today and for taking time out on the weekend. Um, and thank everybody else who's here. I'm gonna stop the recording. Um, <laughs>